Good afternoon in Vietnam, uh, good morning in London, and hello to everyone in between. Um, I'd like to welcome all of you to our webinar, um, Capital Markets Opportunities for Emerging Vietnamese Companies in London. If you're expecting something else, then you're probably on the wrong webinar, um, but you might as well stay on because I can assure you this one will be better. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Gavin Wilkins. I'm the CCO at Hawksford. And for those of you who don't know Hawksford, we're an international provider of corporate, private client and fund services. And we've got a significant focus on Asia, ASEAN and the London markets. But enough about me. Today we'll be discussing why London continues to be an appealing destination for international companies, both to raise capital and increase profile. And we'll be exploring how Vietnamese companies can access those markets. And we're doing this at a time of renewed interest in overseas listings for Vietnamese companies. We've seen some very recent changes to the Vietnamese securities law, which allow Vietnamese companies to raise international capital from overseas. We've just seen the coming into force on the 1st of May of the UK-Vietnam Free Trade Agreement. And it also comes at a time when the UK has firmly stated its desire to join the CPTPP, the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership. There we are, a mouthful. Now we've got somewhat of an all-star cast today covering pretty much all of the angles. And I'm, I'm delighted to be joined by Lisa Banks, the Head of Trade and Investment, uh, British Embassy in, in Hanoi, Brian Bullock, Executive Director at the uh, Britcham Vietnam, Ollie Fox, Primary Market Southeast Asia at the London Stock Exchange, John Edwards, Head of Primary Markets Asia, Pacific and Australia at the London Stock Exchange, Robin Stevens, Senior Advisor at Crow UK, we have Jan Melman, partner at uh, Watson Farley and Williams based in London, and his colleague, Matt Lorimer, partner at Watson Farley and Williams based in Hanoi. We'll be running for around an hour and a half, um, and in that time, we're going to hear some, some insights from those key trade and investment bodies, and also from the London Stock Exchange itself. And then we'll move on to a, a group discussion, which will cover the key commercial, legal and structuring aspects necessary to support an IPO in London. So you'll be pleased to know that we've got time for some Q&A. Um, so that's an opportunity for all of you to ask uh, questions to any or, or all of our experienced uh, speakers today. Um, so please take advantage of that. You should see a, a little Q&A box on the screen. Click in there, pop in your questions at any point during today's webinar. So without further ado, I'm delighted to invite Lisa Banks, the Head of Trade and Investment at the British Embassy in Hanoi, to provide us with a welcome address. Lisa, thank you for taking the time to join us this morning. The floor is yours. Thanks, Gavin. Thanks for the introduction. And uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, or good morning, depending on where you're dialing in from. Um, good afternoon from a very rainy Hanoi, but a warm Hanoi. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, firstly, I want to thank the London Stock Exchange Group, Crow UK and Hawksford for inviting me to speak at this webinar today to discuss prospects for capital markets in Vietnam. This presents a valuable opportunity to share expertise, and I'd like to share my vision of the UK and Vietnam relationship and why I believe that there will be considerable opportunities for businesses from both sides who are looking for a partner or planning market expansion in the near future. There really is something for everyone here. So the UK and Vietnam's bilateral relationship has strengthened significantly since we developed our strategic partnership back in 2010, so 11 years ago now. We reinforced that relationship in 2020, marked by a free trade agreement between our two countries. The UK's financial services brands have been established in Vietnam for a considerable amount of time and have vastly contributed to the growth of the, the economy. They were here before, um, before other international financial services brands. Vietnam's economy has remained resilient despite COVID-19, recording a growth rate of just under 3% in 2020. Its young population, fast growing middle class and stable political environment mean it is likely to continue to outperform the region. That's no mean feat. The Vietnamese government's commitment to improve the business environment is leading to uplifts in international business rankings, upgrades by credit agencies, and increasingly attracting more investment. The UK, as you know, has long been at the forefront of the provision of financial services. Within our financial and professional services ecosystem, we have been working closely with the London Stock Exchange Group 
to achieve shared goals for wider UK prosperity. Many of LSG, LSEG's initiatives have created multiplier effects for the City of London, strengthened the profile and competitiveness of UK financial and professional services, and anchored partnerships with countries from all around the world. There really is a lot to learn from. The Vietnamese stock market is also seeing considerably strong growth. In more than 20 years of establishment, the Vietnamese capital market has transformed from a small market with limited products and capitalization at only 1% of GDP in the year 2000 into a market with a wide range of stocks, bonds and der derivative products worth 104% of GDP just 20 years later. The market is attracting more participants locally as well as internationally drawing a large amount of capital into Vietnam's economy and contributing significantly to the nation's growth. These are grounds for huge prospects for cooperation in various aspects of capital markets, especially with the recent changes in the Vietnam securities regulations, opening the way for Vietnamese companies to tap into the international capital markets that are available to them. It will be exciting to see both countries work together for mutual benefit and to attract more strategic investment into Vietnam. We are also engaging with the Vietnamese government in various areas, including capital markets, green finance and fintech, but these are just some of the areas. We also work alongside Vietnam to improve transparency and the business climate to encourage and facilitate more British businesses to invest and operate and take advantage of all of the opportunities that Vietnam presents. With the UK-Vietnam Free Trade Agreement now in place, it entered into force on the 1st of May, and prospects to collaborate under CPTPP in the very near future, we believe it's in everyone's interest to ensure change, change drives the economy forward. We are delighted to work with both Vietnamese public and private sector to share our expertise and our knowledge and offer support to achieve the right climate so the financial and professional services sector are able to thrive. So thank you for inviting me to address you today. Financial services is a priority area for the UK government and for the British Embassy in Vietnam. So please reach out to us if you need further support. Um, I wish you all a productive morning or afternoon um, and I really look forward to the day when we will all be participating from the same room again. Thank you. Lisa, thank you very much. Um, growth rates of 3%, strong economic performance, free trade agreement, um, Vietnamese government committed to improving the business environment and opportunities for the UK and Vietnam to work together for, for mutual benefit. Um, all very, very positive and, and a great introduction for uh, for today's session, so thank you very much indeed. I'd like to uh, invite now Brian Bullock, Executive Director of the British Chamber of Commerce in Vietnam, or, or BritCham Vietnam as it's better known, to add his welcome to all of you today. Brian, welcome and over to you. Thank you, Gavin, and um, thank you, Lisa, for the, um, the introduction. I bet it's more, uh, more wet here in Ho Chi Minh City than in Hanoi, but um, either way, the country is getting swamped. Um, thank you for joining the, the webinar and um, thank you for, for inviting uh, Britcham Vietnam to introduce itself um, on this platform. <clears throat> um, Britcham Vietnam used to be called British Business Group of Vietnam and it was founded as a small luncheon uh, club in 1991. Um, in 1998 became the first foreign business group to become recognized in Vietnam and, and uh, was known as BBGV until last year when we rebranded to British Chamber of Commerce Vietnam or BritCham. We currently have over 500 members and in um, 2014, we, uh, the BritCham or BBGV at the time founded the Business Center. The business center is to um, facilitate better ties between British and Vietnamese companies uh, via a range of bespoke trade services. Our trade services are designed to help UK companies quickly kickstart their businesses in Vietnam, accurately identify commercial and investment opportunities, grow exports, and further develop their operations in this part of the world. Uh, 
since then, the business group, business center has uh, expanded its services to um, to more to more local um, uh, services for for local Vietnamese companies looking to expand or um, expand their reach to the UK. Um, we officially st established in 2014 with this aim. And some of the things we can do to support you, if you if you switch to the next slide, I think, there we go, or the previous one, sorry. Yeah. So one of the things we, some of the things we are doing to support Vietnamese businesses here in Vietnam um, is business matching. And you can see we're, we're looking for partners searching, finding, supporting one-to-one -one meetings, looking for potential clients, um, supporting agents and distributors and uh, or outsourcing partners. Um, and a more unique um, offering is our inward investment facilitation, which involves helping businesses set up as, and register, translating services, factory and office setup, operational support, HR and financial management. Um, one of our strengths is is creating market studies for our clients through um, through the through the network, sector reports and competitor analysis, and giving a very local um, uh, background research and due diligence to some degree. Um, our BDR, our business development representative, is a professional business development to act locally on your behalf. Um, but since the audience here is probably more uh, local already, um, we we are we're looking at more of the inward investment facilitation services. The Vietnamese market is um, is one of our long-term goals and furthering our our membership in Britcham. So this is one of the things that sets the British Chamber apart from other chambers in Vietnam is that we do offer these business services to our UK clients, and now more increasingly our, our, our Vietnamese companies that are becoming um, more involved in the network. So with that, next slide, please. Can you sk skip to, okay. So the next um, thing I would talk about would be our business center membership. And that is a unique um, offering here because most chambers are focused on their their local, um, are their their international and their and their conglomerates and things like that. But we want to offer a membership for our local Vietnamese companies to, to help them access the network, um, uh, you know, use use the network to be, create exposure. They can use our our platforms to be featured in in the online directory, receive even some membership special rates and enjoy um, membership discounts from uh, some of the partners as well that the chamber offers in through the secretariat. But most importantly, the the aim of Britcham is to facilitate and improve the ties uh, between the UK and Vietnam. And we're happy to to welcome more of our local uh, Vietnamese companies to, to join Britcham. So if there's any questions, I'd be happy to help answer them near the end. And on that, I hand it back to Gavin. Thank you very much indeed, Brian. Uh, that's excellent. Um, thanks for the warm welcome and, and for explaining how uh, Britcham can, can help emerging Vietnamese companies to uh, trade with the UK under the free trade agreement. Um, and now I'm delighted to introduce Ollie Fox from the London Stock Exchange. Uh, Ollie's focus is specifically on Southeast Asia, which is where he's based, and he'll provide us with an overview of the London Stock Exchange, the latest developments, and the opportunities as he sees them. Over to you, Ollie. Thank you, Gavin. Well, good afternoon. Just join in welcoming everybody to the webinar. I know you've already been welcomed a couple of times, so good afternoon to those of you in Asia, and good morning to those who are in the UK. I think we've got off to a very interesting start and thanks to Lisa and Brian for their opening comments. And thanks also to Hawksford for organizing this event and inviting the London Stock Exchange to take part. 
So as Gavin says, I'm Ollie Fox. I'm based in Singapore to represent the LSE's primary market activity in Southeast Asia, um, across the region and including Vietnam. I'm working with companies and looking forward to working with many more that are looking to develop and grow through raising capital. I think this is especially exciting at the moment following the change in regulations in Vietnam that allow Vietnamese companies to extend into international capital markets. This is also a great opportunity for London as the world's most international market, as I will cover in this presentation. Can do the next slide, please. Thank you. So, um, one before, thanks. Um, London is an incredibly international market. We have nearly 2,000 companies from nearly 100 different countries across the globe. The market open images shown on the slide here give us a real sense of this with high profile issuers from the region, including Vina Capital, as well as debt and equity issuance from India, Fiji, Indonesia, to name just a few. London has a pioneering connect program with China and the Shanghai Stock Exchange to allow dual listing of Chinese companies on London, with London being the first country that China has chosen to set up such a link. Next slide, please. Thank you. In, in this slide, we have a few data points to give us a snapshot of the London market. Firstly, noting that those nearly 2,000 equity issuers are worth a combined total market capitalization of over $7 trillion. In the last three years, over $170 billion has been raised on the London market, covering both IPO proceeds as well as significant follow-on issuances. These are around three quarters of the total. Turning now to industry sectors, we have a chart at the bottom right showing the split in London, which although some perceptions might be that London as such an established market would favor old economy companies, banking and such like, actually nearly 50% of capital raised has been in technology over the last three years. I think this helps to demonstrate the vibrancy of the London market, which is also diverse in size, as you can see from the bottom left chart, with no such thing as being too large nor too small for the London market. There are companies listed that range from a few million dollars to multiple tens of billions, showing there can be a place on the London markets for all sizes, sizes and stages of development. Next slide, please. Here I want to highlight also the international nature of the investors on the London market, which is an important factor and differentiator from the US markets. London sits in a very convenient time zone for trading, with market opening during the Asian trading day and remaining open until two hours into the US day. Around one third of all equity is owned by US institutions, which gives the opportunity to have exposure to US investors without some of the potential drawbacks associated with the US listing. These drawbacks might include um, the SEC regulatory environment, potential for litigation, as well as the cost of maintaining Sarbanes-Oxley compliance. Contrasting this then with the US investor base, we can see there that around 90% of investment comes from US investors. Next slide, please. So here, we cover the point that not only are the investors international, but also the issuers on London are international, with nearly 40% of all listed companies being from outside the UK. Six of the 10 largest IPOs last year were international, so London clearly remains a vibrant market for international companies. Companies can be confident of being benchmarked against international peers and importantly, investors who are used to investing in international companies. Next slide, please. This slide particularly highlights that Asian markets are well understood on London. We can see the depth of partnership between Asia Pacific corporates and the LSE. London is very used to Asian companies with 40 billion US dollars raised in the last 10 years and over 170 companies currently listed on London worth a combined nearly $2 trillion in value. Some very well-known names from the region are on the list here with Mitsubishi, Air China, and Samsung. And Samsung is actually one of the most liquid depository receipts on the London market. 
specifically relating to Vietnam, Vale Fund and Vienna Capital have been some of the most successful funds on the London market, but alone remain a relatively limited opportunity for London investors to play the fantastic growth story. So although Asia is well represented in London, there is an opportunity for Vietnamese companies to capitalize on this current scarcity for those investors looking to be part of the growth story. Next slide, please. Covering for a minute now the depth of dual listing on the London market, with over one quarter of companies being dual listed and London very used to making that connection between markets work well. This may be something very relevant to some Vietnamese companies who would like to have an international listing on a market such as London, as well as a home listing. Something that the new regulations open up as a possibility through listing of depository receipts on London. Next slide, please. There are different routes to the London markets, which I'd just like to touch on here. Firstly, AIM, the alternative investment market, is LSE's market for more than 950 high growth companies in 90 global locations. It has raised over $130 billion for growing companies since its inception 25 years ago. The key points are a more flexible regulatory framework and the inclusion of a nominated advisor or nomad to work with the listing company and guide them through the listing process and beyond. Moving to the main market, which is generally seen as being for larger and more established companies, there's the premium segment for listing of equity shares of companies that comply with the UK's highest standards of regulation and corporate governance, which means they can enjoy a lower cost of capital through greater transparency and through building investor confidence. They're also included in indexes such as the FTSE 100, 250 and all share. There is also the option of the standard segment, which is open to global depository receipts and debt securities, allowing issuers to access the main market by meeting EU harmonized standards. Next slide, please. So next we have uh, the green economy mark as an example of LSE's activity in sustainable finance. This is available to companies that generate greater than 50% of their revenues from qualifying sustainable activity. 100 companies split across both the main market and AIM and worth $208 billion in total now have the green economy mark. And these companies have often outperformed the wider universe of listed companies on London, driven in part by investor appetite for supporting such sustainable companies. We might well expect this trend to continue as companies transition to a more sustainable set of activities and new listings on the market are sought to access those investors that are showing a clear interest in this field. Next slide, please. Okay, so finally, I'd just like to cover three landmark listings over recent years, and actually all of these were dual listings. Firstly, NLB, a Slovenian bank which raised just over $1 billion on listing in London. Secondly, from the end of last year, Caspi, which is an exciting fintech company from Kazakhstan that raised around $1 billion and has traded very well since then. And finally, from this year, fixed price. This has actually been one of the largest capital raises so far this year where this Russian retailer raised $1.7 billion on the London market, choosing London as its international home. Next slide, please. Okay, well, that concludes this introductory presentation on the London Stock Exchange, and we can now move into the next section of today's webinar. So I now have the significant pleasure of introducing today's panelists and asking them some questions around their different areas of expertise in the field of international capital raising. We have a very experienced panel today from Crow, Watson, Farley and Williams, the London Stock Exchange, and also our hosts, Hawksford. I've got a few questions to start us off, but please do submit any questions that you may have using the questions portal, and we'll do our best to respond to these for you during this webinar. 
Okay, great. So I can see um, there are smiling faces on here. If we can begin first um, with Robin Stevens from Crow UK um, and begin by considering the financial reporting aspects of an IPO. Um, Robin, in accounting terms, what does a private group need to do to prepare for an IPO? Thank you, Ollie. Uh, and again, just uh, thank you to all the organisers and all the uh, presenters for uh, taking part in uh, today's events. Um, I've got some slide, a slide that uh, will answer some of the, or help to answer uh, some of these questions. So if you could have the, the next next slide, Denisha. Uh, so that's me uh, and the next one, right. These slides are in both uh, Vietnamese and English. So if it's okay with you, I'll, I'll go down the English, the English side, unless you want to wait for a uh, parallel universe for me to answer in Vietnamese. Um, I think the good news is um, there's no real reason why any well-run, well-organized private company can't evolve and transition to being a public company. Um, moving a private company to a public market takes time, takes planning, but with, with, with that time, with that planning, in accounting terms, there shouldn't be any uh, major issues. In terms, of, in terms of compliance, the accounting compliance requirements in London uh, are not onerous, uh, and, the, and the post admission the continuing obligations are easily should be easily achieved. Uh, in terms of the historic numbers, uh, as long as the company has financial information uh, that is no more than nine months old, um, that's the information that needs to be included within the uh, prospectus or the admission documents, uh, either three years or less than three years. The company's been going for a shorter period. And once the company's on the market, uh, the uh, annual figures need to be presented within six months, the interim figures uh, within three months. Those are Those are end targets ideally you want to be, be presenting the information sooner but those those timetables those timings shouldn't be an issue to uh, to most companies uh, looking at a, uh, a uh, listing in london um in pure accounting terms i guess the key elements for success in planning firstly clearly you have some sound and effective financial controls uh, those can be worked on and evolved over the the, the, uh, the uh, and during the planning process uh, be able to produce timely and accurate management uh, reporting information uh, on a monthly basis uh, within two or three weeks of the year end. Um, have an experienced CFO, or if, you, if, the, if the CFO isn't necessarily experienced in public company transactions, which is probably not surprising, uh, there's, there's time for that for that person to, to learn that, uh, to be uh, uh, trained and to learn that experience, but also if need be to actually go out and recruit during that so pre IPO process. Um, the company would need to be preparing accounts in compliance with international financial reporting standards. Again, the good news is most jurisdictions' own national standards of accounting have merged towards or converged towards the IFRS. So again, that's unlikely to be a major issue now, although it may, may have been 20 years ago. Um, and also be able to produce realistic and supportable uh, financial projections uh, with uh, sane and sensible assumptions. These projections are not used in the public domain, but are important to, are important to ensure the company has sufficient working capital. Um, and then finally, in accounting terms, taxation clearly is very important. Taxation looking backwards to make certain there aren't any tax issues that um, uh, would either preclude an IPO or need, or, or need uh, uh, major uh, reorganization and looking forward to make certain the structure in place is is, uh, is um, uh, supportable and understood uh, and I guess our advice generally in terms of taxes keep it simple don't try and over engineer so in accounting terms all those things should be achievable over the six nine twelve month uh, pre-IPO planning process commercially uh, the company obviously needs to show quality good governance and value for investors Hey, that's that, that's great, Robin. Very very clear. A number of important aspects to um, con consider there, and some key advice around keeping things keeping things simple. Um, if we move on next, how would you say that a company can become investor ready and make itself attractive to potential investors from a financial viewpoint? Thanks, Ollie. Good 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 question. Um, next slide, please, Denisha. Excellent. Well, I think um, I think the, you know, the key thing here, really, um, in terms of becoming investor ready, is looking to improve, if you like, the quality of the profits. We always always talk about um, how a company is, is, is valued, and we may get questions on that later. Um, and a company is valued on a mixture of its profits, its earnings, but also the quality of those earnings. So, the trick here over the over the pre-IPO period is to try and improve the quality of those profits by reducing risk, uh, and to uh, be able to show that those 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 that income, those profits are sustainable 
So just going through these almost in this order, normally I wouldn't do, do that, but I think they all are uh, relevant, so I'll spend a few seconds on each of them. Clearly having a strong and complete management team is important uh, with clear succession planning. If you're looking to sell the company, then having succession planning probably isn't terribly important. But if you're looking to actually run the business as a public company, then that is important. And having a strong team uh, at all levels of the, of the business is important. Um, having a, a, a business model is scalable. Uh, it's one thing to grow to a certain size, but you've got to be able to show to investors that the business can grow. Most investors, or nearly all investors, are investing in the future, not the past. So having a, having a model that will grow both organically and maybe by acquisition is very important. If possible, move to higher margin products or services. So again, the quality of your earnings is, is improved. Uh, it's one thing being a high volume, low margin business, and that can be very profitable. But ideally, um, moving towards higher margins and higher quality products and services would be ideal in terms of uh, becoming attractive to uh, investors. Where possible, build barriers of entry um, against, other, uh, against other competitors based either on uh, technical excellence or market knowledge or just scale. Uh, again, working towards improving the quality of the earnings, not just not just the um, the total. Having a uh, reliable and robust accounting and management information system. Um, not not all private companies have that, but certainly during the pre-IPO process, there's no reason why that can't be uh, achieved, as I mentioned earlier. Importantly, enhance corporate governance and appoint uh, independent non-executive directors earlier rather than later. Uh, getting experience of people who have been through the process before is invaluable. In many cases, the independent directors aren't appointed, aren't appointed until quite late in the process. But the earlier you do that, the more value you get from the process. Uh, sometimes groups need to be re uh, uh, restructured uh, and reorganized. Many uh, private companies are run maybe uh, not as a group, or maybe on, as a separate companies. So again, just putting a new holding company um, above those to float that company. And you'll be hearing further from Yan and, and um, and from, uh, from Matt and, and, and Gavin really on, on the, some of those structural issues going forward. Um, in terms of protecting what you've got and what you're using, make certain you've got, to, you've got to rights over any uh, intellectual property that, that the company is using, uh, either, either your own or from uh, third, third parties. Um, next slide, please, Tanisha. And and then looking at, at other areas to, to uh, restructure in advance, looking maybe to dispose of non-core activities and assets. Again, many private groups may have grown up maybe as a conglomerates or maybe having fear for other activity. Important to focus on those businesses or those assets which are, are core to the business. So that might involve some, some uh, pre-IPO disposals to ensure you can focus on those parts of the business which will, be, which will attract more investor interest. Looking to see whether or not there are any uh, strategic acquisitions out there that you might be able to do in advance. Uh, if part of your policy is to grow by acquisition, if you've done some acquisitions before the IPO, that will be ideal. Not always possible, but, but good to do. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, make certain the company is adopting uh, international financial reporting standards or the national standards uh, converge with those. Shouldn't be an issue. Making certain the company's audit has, uh, the audit has been carried out in accordance with international auditing, auditing standards. Again, uh, certainly easy, uh, relatively easier to do additional work on that uh, on that uh, on the audits if, if that's required. But in most jurisdictions, that uh, that wouldn't be necessary. Um, carrying out a detailed tax review, uh, going back again, making certain the tax structure works historically. Uh, there aren't any issues there, but also importantly, works going forward. Um, reduce dependence where possible on particular customers, products, staff. Again, if you reduce risk, you increase valuations uh, and. Uh, Looking at any areas of the business which are, are of dependence uh, sooner rather than later is, good move, is a good move. Um, the last two points are arguably the most important. Um, most companies come to market either to rate, well, both, both to raise money and to raise profile. In terms of raising money, uh, some of that money you're looking to raise may well be already in the business. It may just be sitting in stock or debtors or uh, uh, or. Uh, in creditors or the creditors maybe uh, are not high enough sometimes. So anything you can do to improve the terms of trade, the, way, the basis on which you trade with customers and suppliers to, to convert more of the profit into cash is helpful. Helpful because it may mean you need to raise less cash, but also helpful because it shows you have a very efficient business. Uh, so looking at terms of trade, looking at how you trade with customers, suppliers is, is, is crucial. Actually, whether you're looking to float or sell, it's, it's uh, it's valid um, in either case. And arguably the most important point of the whole day, appoint experienced advisors. Uh, advisors actually like the faces you see on top of the screen here. 
people who have been through the process before know how the market works and know how to give independent objective advice on the, on what's required. I'm sorry that was a bit long, but I think I thought it was important Ollie, to get all those points across um, on the slides. Right. Thanks, thanks very much for that, Robin. A, a comprehensive list of, of, of things to be to be considered um, around this, and I think that sort of quite neatly leads us into we talked about the financial reporting aspects and what it takes to become investor ready. What would you say from your experience are the key lessons that can be learned from successful IPOs and apply those to others who are looking to IPO? Yes, again, I think it's, 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 it's an important point, and I'm sure each of the speakers today will have, sort of, have maybe slightly different different uh, areas I'd like to emphasize. I think for me, uh, there's probably there's probably four, and if we could just go on to the next slide. Um, the first one is possibly the most important, is, is actually one of valuation. Uh, many people look or can look to try and maximize the value the value of a company on an IPO. At the end of the day, you know, in many cases, it's largely a paper valuation. Uh, all right, you're raising money, but you're raising generally a relatively small proportion of the company's value at that stage. And um, if you try and maximize the value of the business on on the IPO, you need to think about well, what's the what's the value left for investors? So my advice, my advice would be to go out at a valuation that's fair, that's reasonable, that's attractive. I mean, don't sell the company cheap, but go out at a valuation that is sensible. That's where by investors who come into the who come into the company can see growth. Because the great thing about London, and you and you talked about it earlier, Ollie, it's not just the IPO funds, which is obviously very good, but it's the ability to raise money relatively easily thereafter. So if people come in, invest from day one, make money between day one and day two. Or maybe day 100, uh, they're more likely to come back, come, come, back and, come, come back and again and invest. So, so going out at the right value, a value that you can see grow, I think is is um, is, is, is crucial. Um, I think also sort of linked to that is the fact that admission to to, 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 to any market isn't isn't the end. It's 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 a beginning. It's the end of a process, but it's the beginning of the growth of the business. So again, uh, going back to valuations to an extent, but um, in the way that the, the work has just started on the IPO. You then got to achieve what you say you you uh, you, you plan to achieve. Um, communications is is is, is crucial. Um, I've seen too many companies come to market, not just from overseas but from the UK as well. Have come to market and they then go quiet. There's not much interaction between the company and investors. And then when they come back to to the market to raise money, they're a little bit surprised because no one's paying much attention to you to, to them. So yeah. Communication is an ongoing basis. Make certain that once you're on the market, you you keep the you keep the market informed about what's going on with the business. You they're, and they're aware of of, uh, of both good things. And if things don't go quite as well as planned, just keep people informed. They'll be much more engaged with you as you come back. And I guess there's a line in this on this slide that says invest time and effort in the market, and the market will invest in you. And I think that's not guaranteed, but it's much more likely to happen if if they know what you where you are and what you're doing, than if you've um, if you're a best kept secret. Um, Linked to that really is actually one of expectations. I think I think uh, like uh, many things in life, if you're under promise and overachieve, that's good news. So if you're going out with information about growth, you know, don't don't oversell the company. Be 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 prudent, be cautious. So uh, hopefully, when you come to market, when, when the results come out, when the when the, uh, when the when the activities are in the public um, domain, people can, can see that you've at least achieved what you plan to achieve, and and hopefully more. And then finally, in in uh, financial terms, yeah. Control working capital, make certain that the cash is that the cash works, uh, and also throughout maintain strong corporate governance. The, the the corporate governance requirements on the UK markets are very are very easy to achieve. They're based as much on principles as they are on rules. They're based on uh, um, either complying or or disclose why you're not complying. Those 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 rules are relatively easy to to comply with, and I think uh, yeah we would always always advise clients to yeah, over over comply in terms of uh, of corporate governance because it gives investors confidence and confidence leads to value leads to the ability to raise funds going forward so those those in a nutshell or rather quite a big nutshell are my are my points on uh, what i would see as the key issues and post for post ipo success but obviously very happy to answer further questions uh, later on in the process thanks ollie okay thanks for that robin i'm hoping there will be some additional questions for you we, we just lost your video slightly at the point where you were explaining that the um, admission process is the start of the journey and, and not the end, which I think is a very, very important and interesting thought. So thanks, thanks very much for that. Um, moving on next, I'm, I'm pleased to introduce Jan Melman and Matt Lorimer, and both the partners from international legal firm Watson, Farley and Williams. 
and Jan is, is dialing in from, from London, and Matt from Hanoi. If I can just go for the, go for the question, good morning and good afternoon, Jan and, and Matt. Uh, question first is, as a company looking to access international markets, what are the main things that I need to consider from a, from a legal perspective? Yes, thank you, Ollie. Good question. And uh, if we can move to the next slide, please. We've got um, some of the things that need to be considered. So uh, perhaps the most obvious thing to say is that for a listing, you need to prepare a prospectus. And that prospectus is a really quite detailed document that uh, provides an overall description of the company and its business. And, and that's really the core of it, because you've got to provide uh, a good overall description of the company, uh, all of its subsidiaries, uh, what those companies do, uh, how they make money or how they are proposing to make money. And, and you have to do that in a way which is complete and accurate and not misleading. And so it's very important to make sure that that description is not just, uh, not just a selling description, but also an accurate one that can be uh, suitably supported by appropriate information. So that's really the core of it. Um, another part that I think is extremely important is who the board are and who the key personnel are, because very often in listings, one of the main things that investors look to is the quality of the board and the management of the group that's proposed to be listed. And so it's important both to make sure that um, existing management has the right uh, quality, but also uh, particularly when you're looking at a dual listing or, or, or an IPO from Vietnam to London, to make sure that you have some people on the board who have requisite experience of London listed company uh, work. La obviously, one of the purposes of the IPO is also to raise money. And so there is a real focus in the prospectus as to what the proposed sources of money are in terms of the investors that you're looking to raise money from and where they're coming from. But also uh, very obviously on the proceeds of that fundraising and how those proceeds are going to be used, because that is something that investors will very much be focused on. So that, that's really, I would say, the, the, the nub of um, what any company wants to say in the prospectus. But associated with that, there are a number of other things that have to be provided because of the form and content requirements for uh, prospectuses, which are not very different from those in other countries, but they are um, quite detailed and have to be complied with. So uh, there's obviously, appropriate historical financial information on the company and the group that has to be provided. And Robin has covered that uh, very well indeed. Um, there is usually a section around taxation and how that affects the company and its investors. Uh, there's usually a detailed legal section with additional information on the company, its constitutional documentation, um, you know, the material contracts that it's party to and all those sorts of things. And again, that's uh, quite important to focus on. Uh, last but not least, risk factors is a very important part of the prospectus because one thing that um, investors will want to know and any market requires to be included in a prospectus is a good description of the risk factors that affect the company. And that's focused both on specific risk factors relating to the particular company and its business, and also more general economic or political or other risk factors that might affect um, businesses in a particular country or region, or businesses operating in a particular sector. And so that leads then very neatly into the other part that I think is absolutely crucial from a legal perspective, and that's due diligence and verification. So as part of the process of preparing the prospectus and preparing for the prospectus, 
uh, there will be detailed due diligence done on the company and its group, uh, and that's legal due diligence as well as the accounting due diligence and other due diligence that's been referred to already. And that's to make sure that uh, there's a good understanding of the contracts that are in place, uh, you know, potentially some issues to be sorted out, as, as Robin has mentioned, any, any, any pre-IPO restructuring, anything like that. But ultimately, the due diligence that's being done and then the verification that's being done on the prospectus is all designed, as I mentioned earlier, to make sure that the investment documentation that the investors see is true, complete and accurate. Um, and that helps to make sure that you're uh, getting good investment for the long term and that you don't encounter any issues uh, following an IPO. Okay, fan fantastic, Jan. So a, a lot of detail there around the, the, the process around the prospectus. Um, clearly, a lot of things people will spend time talking with their legal advisor with during the, the IPO process. If you could just sort of take us beyond the IPO process now and um, discuss something that Robin mentioned briefly before, what, what kind of corporate governance requirements can I expect to operate as a public listed company on an international market such as London? Yeah, thank you, Ollie. Um, if we can move to the next slide, please. Uh, Robin already touched on this, but it is worth spending a bit more time on, I think. So um, for any listing on the London market, uh, a company will be required to make sure that appropriate governance arrangements are in place for that company. And those will not surprisingly depend a little bit on the type of listing that's being done, the type of company in its business, and also the industry sector that it's involved in. But there's a, no there's a number of particular items worth mentioning, I think. The first, which I've touched on already, is um, the idea of making sure that you have a board that is um, suitable for a London listing. And that includes, amongst other things, having appropriate independent non-executive directors on the board who can help the executive management to ensure proper governance of the company. Um, Obviously, because the company is being listed, its shares will be traded publicly. So there are also a number of requirements around share dealing. And so it will be entirely normal to put in place a share dealing code for the company uh, to the extent the one's not already in place as suitable if, if you're dual listing a company. Uh, then you would expect to have a number of policies to deal with governance arrangements, and those include anti-bribery and corruption policies, uh, diversity and inclusion policies, uh, environmental health and safety policies, particularly for companies where that's important in their industry sector, uh, risk management policies, social media policies. Uh, the, these are all important and they're all important because um, you want to make sure that the company is completely fit for listing when it's IPO'd and also fit for meeting all the various continuing obligations that apply post IPO and that's something that Robin again mentioned you, you know you want to make sure not only that your IPO is successful but that your company is still being seen to be successful and growing 12 months 24 months post IPO and um, these various governance arrangements are, are all designed to ensure that uh, you have the best chance of success in running the business and also in governing it from a listing perspective. Associated with that um, and the non-exec directors that I mentioned earlier, you will have a number of committees put in place. There'll be an audit committee to make sure that there's appropriate financial reporting and that that's all being considered properly. Uh, a remuneration committee to make sure that uh, the, the board is being properly rewarded, meaning neither over nor under rewarded, I would say. Um, a nominations committee to make sure that appropriate nominations are made. Uh, a compliance committee to make sure that uh, indeed the listing rules are appropriately complied with. And if, if you set up the board and the committees properly to start with and give everyone the right responsibilities, then actually you're in a good place to make those things happen. Um, 
I will hand over to Matt now to mention some of the particular Vietnamese requirements that also need to be considered. So welcome, Matt. Thanks, yeah. Hello, everyone. Uh, Vietnamese law has got certain restrictions on overseas ownership of companies, which apply on a sector-by-sector -sector basis. So any shares of a Vietnamese company that are listed overseas and owned by overseas investors will need to comply with these restrictions. Now, the restrictions are set out in the new law of investment and have been kind of recently detailed in new guidance in what's known as Decree 31, which was only issued on the 26th of March this year. And the restrictions can either be absolute pro prohibitions on investments or conditional restrictions. And the conditional restrictions can relate to the percentage of a company that may, may be held by foreign investment, the form of investment or the scope of investment. Now, as I said, Decree 31 is very new, and so we don't really have full detail on how these controls apply. So we kind of we're still watching this space in a way. But and, and I know we've had a question in the chat about offshore wind, which kind of that's an area quite close to my heart and something that I think is going to be one of the really big growth sectors in Vietnam. And it's quite interesting to know that offshore wind is one of the areas that could have potential restrictions on overseas investments. And this is because, because of kind of border control issues and kind of the constant access you have between from, from ships servicing offshore wind or, and kind of access to the ports. So that's quite an interesting area that may have restrictions. And speaking more generally, one point we mentioned on the slide is that under the old law, a lot of a lot of a lot of important sectors had restrictions on the amount of control rather than the amount of ownership that could be granted to foreign foreign investors. So this meant you could issue non-voting shares to overseas companies without kind of filling up your restrictions on control by overseas investors. And this is still technically possible with the GDRs and is included in Decree 155, which, apologies for the legal jargon, that's, that's kind of the decree that sets out the new regime for GDRs. And whilst it's possible to issue non-voting shares, you do have to consider whether that would be an attractive investment for overseas, but whether overseas investors would be willing to invest in a company without having any control over its policies. Great, thanks for that, Jan and Matt, and also for, for covering um, Neville Anderson's question that you submitted, or, or largely covering Neville Anderson's question. It sounds like it's something um, that would be would be worth exploring a bit a bit further to understand the best way to attract um, British investors for a, for a company yeah. in the offshore wind sector. Yeah, we're we're um, doing an awful lot in offshore wind at the moment, so I'd be happy to have that. I mean, I, I know it's probably not an area of interest for everyone, so I'd be happy to have that discussion offline. Okay, and certainly something that fits within the, um, the, the the green economy sector of the um, London Stock Exchange very well too. So if if we if we move on and stick with you still, please, Matt. Um, we've there's been a significant change in the law this year for um, Vietnamese companies to be able to access international capital markets. When it comes to an IPO on London, would I be listing shares? Or would it be depositing receipts? And effectively, what does, what does that mean? Yeah, if you move on to the next slide, hopefully we've set out a bit of detail on this. So just by way of background, while the new Vietnamese law allows Vietnamese companies to issue depository receipts for listing overseas, this is not the only way that a Vietnamese company can access overseas markets. And it's always been possible to create an offshore holding company that owns all or a percentage of shares in the Vietnamese company and then list the shares of that holding company. Now, there's no right or wrong answer as to whether you should issue GDRs or use a holding company. But what we've done on this slide, I think, is just set out some of the potential advantages and disadvantages and some of the factors you need to consider. Firstly, when you use an overseas holding company, you can choose an attractive jurisdiction for yourselves. And in particular, you can pick a jurisdiction that London investors are familiar with, for example, Jersey. And investors will understand the listing process for a Jersey company 
and they feel a lot more comfortable investing through Jersey, even if the underlying economic benefit and risk is here in Vietnam. And set against that, the GDRs are generally pretty well understood in London. And we don't see any particular concern in the Vietnamese legislation that would make it difficult to issue depository receipts in London for procedural re reasons. And the next point is on the foreign ownership restrictions. And I've mentioned those in a bit more detail in the last slide, so I won't go into too much detail here. But I think it's worth mentioning that the restrictions on foreign ownership apply equally to whether you're listing GDRs or going through a holding company. The next point to consider is that if you have a holding company, you're going to need to create, you're going to need to go, need to go into a process to put that holding company in place. And I think Gavin's going to talk in that in a bit more detail in his section. But one thing to bear in mind is that it may be quite difficult for Viet existing Vietnamese investors to hold their share through an overseas holding company, and they may need to obtain government approvals for this investment. And so this is a potential disadvantage for using hold holding companies. And kind of one of the advantages for a holding company is that if you have an offshore holding company in place, that could be like a really useful vehicle for future expansion overseas. So you could then, you, that holding company could then set up a company in, say, another jurisdiction, Thailand, or another, another area where you're looking to expand into, and that might make this quite an interesting, quite an interesting route. And the final point you have to consider, of course, is some of the benefits that you might get for tax reasons. And for example, there may be reduced withholding tax on dividends if you set up your holding company in a, in a jurisdiction that has a favorable tax treaty with Vietnam. And I think that will hopefully move us quite nicely onto Gavin's questions, where he'll talk in kind of a bit more detail about some of the jurisdictions that might be attractive and some of the reasons and some of the reasons why. That's, that's great, uh, Matt. And of course, yes, this is going to seamlessly into Gavin's section. I'd like to reintroduce um, Gavin Wilkins of Corporate Service Provider Hawksford and our host today um, to the to the panel. Um, exactly as Matt said, we've been talking about the GDR route or international holding company. Perhaps GDRs are likely to be used by the very largest companies. Um, but international holding companies, I expect, to be a more popular choice for many businesses. Would you mind, please, um, drilling into that a bit more for us now and explaining it um, on this webinar? It'd be a pleasure. Thanks, Ollie. Um, if we can move on to the next slide. Oh, which is a photo of me. Uh, the next slide. That's perfect. Thank you. Um, so I guess I guess if we're going down the oh, onto the next slide, please. If we're going down the holding company route, the international holding company route, um, I guess the first consideration is well, it's really going to be, do you want that holding company to be in the UK or, or in another international jurisdiction like Jersey, as, as Matt mentioned? And I think, you know, the, probably the majority of, uh, of, of companies on, on the London Stock Exchange are UK companies. And and really, the, the, the thing that you'd look at there is whether you've got significant revenue generating activities taking place in the UK. You know, if, it, if a large proportion of, of your revenue and economic activities are going to be UK driven, then it may actually make sense for you to, uh, to set up a, a holding company in the UK um, if you're going to use an international holding company. I think in the majority of cases for uh, an emerging Vietnam Vietnamese business, that's probably not going to be the case. The majority of uh, revenue generating and economic activities will be outside the UK. So that that then would, would take you down the route of saying, well, you know, what what's what are the trends? What what has everyone else done? And some statistics on on the um, slide there, you can see that that Jersey compared to other um, international finance center um, significantly um, greater market capitalization of uh, of Jersey companies listed on the, the London Stock Exchange. 129 billion there, um, and that's across the main market and, and AIM. So what, why is that? Um, I, I think there's a number of factors. So I've pulled out some additional information on the slide, but there's a very strong track record um, that Jersey does actually have the greatest number of international companies that are listed in the FTSE 100 and on AIM. Um, 
and Jersey companies are listed on major stock exchanges across the globe. There's a combined market capitalization of coming up for 300 billion US dollars. There's a strong corporate governance framework in, in place in, in Jersey, which is internationally respected. And I think all the panelists so far have referred to the importance of corporate governance in terms of the uh, uh, IPO process. So that, that's a really strong point for, uh, for investors. Jersey's got a, uh, a um, well-respected internationally. Its international standing is strong. It's well regarded by the OECD and the IMF as a cooperative international finance center. So Jersey's actually continued to strengthen its uh, position as a preferred jurisdiction for holding companies for listings in London relative to other international finance centers that are, are just further away from the market. Um, Jersey's politically stable. Last time I looked, it was AA minus rated by S&P, and it's got some uh, some pretty sizable fiscal buffers. So in terms of stability, that's ticking the box. The tax environment's straightforward. It's, it's tax neutral, um, so, and there's also certainty. We've got economic substance laws in place in, in Jersey that uh, that provide certainty in terms of that structure. But you know, the important points around the the interaction with the stock exchange. It, Jersey is is well integrated with the London markets. There's a you know there's trading links that go back um, financially for uh, for decades. Um, shares are settled through Crest, the UK share share settlement system, without the need to establish uh, DIs. And investors in in London listed Jersey companies are protected or can be protected by the UK takeover code. So I think that that's a number of the key factors. I think what that boils down to is that. Uh, um, institutional investors and their advisors kind of kind of trust Jersey from a governance stability um, and familiarity perspective and it's also close to the market. Okay excellent thanks Gavin. Um, so if we just follow on from that um, how do I actually go about implementing a new international holding company if I want to do so? Sure uh, next slide please. Well, we've gone, gone beyond. I've, I've written there the question about GDRs and international holding companies, which, of course, Matt has covered. So we're, we're in terms of my content, we're going firmly down the uh, international holding company route. There's, there's really three scenarios. The, the first is is where um, you're putting together a, a, a special purpose acquisition company or SPAC. So you're actually forming a new company to go and make an investment. Uh, in that case, that's really straightforward because you're establishing your international company at the outset. In, in this case, in terms of the content of today, you're more likely to be talking about an existing business, an existing corporate structure. So in that case, you, you uh, would need to be thinking about a group reorganization prior to the listing. Um, that would be the purpose of which would be to introduce the holding company to the existing structure. Normally, that's done through a share for share exchange. Um, and the third uh, mechanism would be to structure an existing holding company. Um, that that would be where you have an international company in place, but but it's probably um, far from the market, or or you may wish to uh, to change that domicile to to be closer to London in advance of the listing for all the advantages that we spoke about before. Um, you can re-domicile. You can do a cross-border merger. All pretty complicated. In many cases, it's just quite easy to to bolt a new company on top. But uh, if you do and you're already listed, then uh, a readmission process will apply. So it's just worth noting that. Whichever of those routes you, you, you take, you're going to end up with something that looks pretty similar to that structure diagram on the right. Um, so shareholders coming in via Crest into the listed um, Jersey company listed in London. You may want to use an intermediate holding company. Um, you may consider, for example, a UK intermediate hold co to benefit from uh, the recent free trade agreement. So you get the best of both worlds. You've got the uh, the access to the UK free trade agreement and all the advantages of the, the Jersey holding company. So that'd be the international structure, which will own um, up to 100% of the trading and operating business in Vietnam. And I say up to 100% because, of course, you know, A, there's a choice in there, but, but B, we go back to... Uh, to Matt's points under Decree 31 in terms of uh, investment restrictions and, and uh, sectoral uh, limits. But in those cases, it shouldn't be too much of, a, of an impact because of course the, the uh, international structure can hold any proportion of shares 
uh, and still have a hundred percent of its capital listed on the market. So you've got the uh, the governance and control aspects coming through, at least in terms of that proportionate holding. Um, so that's that's how you would go about, Ollie, implementing the the new international holding company. Okay, thanks, thanks for that, Gavin. And sort of continuing on the the theme, what sort of company structuring considerations are common prior to the the IPO? Sure. Next slide, please. Yeah. So the 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 first points really are. are, are um, um, this about structure and more more about thinking about the the impact of, of restructuring so a lot of these have been covered by our previous panelists so in terms of corporate governance arrangements identifying non-executive directors thinking about the substance requirements so starting to think about it, it, if you are implementing a restructure what that means in terms of uh, in terms of what you'll have to manage within the business going forward um, we talked about group restructuring. You know, you, you may want to divest business outside the IPO. There may be a need for a group reorganization to uh, to bring in a, a holding company or intermediate holding company. So you're going to have to start thinking about setting those businesses up. And of course, that will quickly take you down the route of uh, of considering um, service provision, unless you want to become an expert in uh, company secretarial services, uh, legal accounting and advisory. You may want to think about outsourcing models and, uh, and and how you'll utilize that in terms of other pre-ipo considerations well you know the the business um has uh, has got to where it is um that th through having great staff in many cases so so you want to to find mechanisms to uh to retain those but also to to attract um top quality talent going forward and, and often using paper as the basis for remuneration so employee incentive schemes and related structuring are, are a common consideration as is wealth planning and structuring by by the founders of the business because often there'll be a, a wealth creation event perhaps a partial exit and in the future uh, progressively um, uh, exit considerations will become relevant so that that sort of planning is uh, is important at an early stage and before the IPO um, so I think they're the, the key areas that, that will be considered. Okay, thanks very much. Very good, Gavin. Um, and now I've got the great pleasure of introducing my colleague, John Edwards, um, Head of Primary Markets for Asia from the London Stock Exchange, usually based in Beijing, but I think in, in London at the moment. So good morning, John. Um, good morning. Hopefully you can, hey, good morning, good morning. Hopefully you can cover some of your experience in listing international companies in, in London. Um, so firstly, John, what would you say is the track record of London for listings of companies from emerging markets? Uh, thank you very much, Ali. And, and firstly, thank you to all the, uh, the speakers today uh, who have done such a great job in, in detailing the, uh, the steps uh, you can take to, to come to markets like the London Stock Exchange. And I'll have to say that it will definitely be worth uh, taking those steps and going through the process uh, because this is a very welcoming market for emerging markets companies, for international companies generally, as, as Ali, uh, you pointed out uh, in your introductory remarks. Uh, this is a very international exchange uh, with investors that are, are keyed in on um, those global stories, particularly in emerging markets where there is so much growth to be had. Uh, in both uh, innovative sectors, but as well as traditional sectors uh, that that still have so much so much room uh, to grow. Um, before I became uh, head of APAC, I was actually looking after Russia, which is of course uh, it came up a couple of times in your slides as well, Ali, um, you know, with with companies like Fixed Price, which came in March, uh, and, and Raise Capital, which is a retail company. Uh, we've had a lot of success, of course, with the uh, the Russian companies in, in the past. There are 83 companies uh, that are on the London Stock Exchange from Russia with an aggregate market capitalization of over 700 billion. Uh, and these are companies that have uh, have come mostly uh, using GDRs, uh, raising you know uh, many of them billions, uh, some multiple billions uh, at IPO, uh, and also using the uh, the aftermarket. Um, so these are large companies doing cross-border listings. Uh, so 
they that establishes sort of the benchmark. Uh, and it's not just the Russia story. You know, we've got GDRs from uh, India, uh, we've got GDRs from, from Korea, Egypt, um, and we're hoping that very soon we'll have GDRs from Vietnam. So these, as, as you'll notice, many of these are very large companies raising billions. But I don't want to leave people with the perception that that's uh, that if you're a smaller company, you know, looking to raise a couple hundred, uh, that you, you can't use the GDR. Uh, Bank of Georgia is a good case. Uh, they raised uh, about $160 million at a market capitalization of around $450 million. Uh, and they still had uh, a pretty uh, pretty liquid aftermarket, which meant that they, the shares are pretty well distributed, you know, for a company of that size. So that gives you an indication of uh, of the type of size you need to be uh, for GDR. Uh, and of course, Gavin and the others have talked about uh, other ways to market. Uh, we've, of course, been a very successful platform uh, for smaller and mid-cap companies uh, from overseas. Uh, the AIM market, for example, uh, when I first started in 2003, uh, I was introduced to a company called Highland Gold. It's been very successful on the market. That was, a, that was an AIM company uh, in, the, in the mining space. Um, you know, which is uh, one of those sectors where you see, uh, in many cases, you know, a early stage company uh, that doesn't have any production yet, no profits, but is still able to come to the market. You see this as well in uh, spaces like uh, healthcare and pharma. There's a company called Renalytics, which is uh, diagnostics for kidney disease, another huge, huge area. That company has no profits. It, it also, uh, for most of its life, had no revenue. Um, but this is a company that continues to do well in the market and continues to sell its story and communicate um, you know, what it's doing in terms of market development. So just broadly speaking, yes, uh, emerging markets more than welcome. Vietnam people are watching Vietnam, uh, especially those guys that have been investing in companies like Vin Capital. You mentioned if you look at their share price over the last uh, year, it's, it's doubled. Uh, people want access to Vietnam uh, and they want it through the GDR. They'll want it through uh, buying a jersey company if that can be incorporated. Uh, so very excited about uh, about the developments in Vietnam. Yeah, that's, that, that's that's great, John. Co covering that point, companies large or small, different routes to the to the to the London market, but possibilities. And in, um, we're starting to run a little bit short on time, and we've got some very interesting questions that have that have come in. Can I just ask you, John, to, to just cover something a little bit more around what a, what a company might expect to see in respect of an interest, increase in, in interest in them from international investors um, if, uh, if a Vietnamese company lists on London? That's a very good point. I mean, I, I think if you're looking at cross-listing, so for companies that have a listing, let's say, in the Vietnamese market, they're looking to get incremental investors. Um, investors, uh, you know, it's broadened, broadened and deepened that pool of investors. And that's something that we have seen with other GDR issuances, where they can uh, come to market, do the GDR, especially as we see in the rules, it's a fungible instrument. So you're going to be able to, you know, have buying and selling across across the borders. And that is going to greatly contribute uh, to the interest uh, in those companies, uh, whether they're listed in Vietnam or whether they have the GDR listed uh, in London. If a company is doing a direct listing, uh, let's say using a Jersey uh, a holding company as, as well, you know, we, you know, we have seen uh, with those companies that have choos chosen to go to AIM or to sta do standard listings, um, if they have the right uh, campaign, if they have the right setup, if they're talking to the markets, doing early look, uh, there's, again, tremendous interest in Vietnam. And, and again, it really doesn't matter what sector it is as long as they're telling their story. Okay, terrific. So I think this is a, a theme that we've seen throughout this um, webinar of the, the significant interest that there is in the Vietnamese growth story and the opportunities in capital markets. These being um, increased in recent times, particularly for the larger companies through um, the, the ability to do GDRs. Um, we can move to some questions that we've had coming in during the course of the, the course of the, the webinar. And the first one, um, I'm going to pass to um, Robin, Robin Stevens of, of Crow to cover. So this is a question from, from, from um, Kang Tran. 
And the question is, as you know, the big challenges for Vietnamese companies to carry out an IPO in the UK could be relevant to IFRS accounting and transforming Vietnamese accounting standards, harmonizing these to IFRS. Um, Robin, have you got any guidance on um, the, the, the process here um, for a Vietnamese company that is looking to undertake this? Um, thanks, Ollie. Yes, uh, we've, we've looked at this in the past, not just in Vietnam, but in the, in the region um, generally. Um, certainly, we work closely with our Crow teams in Hanoi and Ho Chi Minh City, working with, with the clients to look at their look at the accounting record, the accounting records, and the uh, accounting policies that currently apply to their to their um, uh, financial statements in in Vietnam and see how those will be impacted. Um, in most cases, the actual uh, change to the numbers is, is is quite limited. Sometimes there are adjustments around income recognition, sometimes around goodwill and intangibles. But generally, the accounting uh, adjustments are relatively light. What is more onerous uh, or, or more detail is the level of uh, disclosures in the accounts, the level of of the notes to the financial statements. But having said that, it's it's not a it's, it's not a difficult task. Um, it's something that probably you know, we've done either ourselves for a client or with with with, with third parties. It's probably about a month's work, or it's probably two weeks over a month to actually take take a three year historical records uh, and convert that into both an IF, uh, both IFRS numbers. To say where I say that the the changes to the results is often are often quite small, but just it's just a case of of, uh, of the further disclosures. And once you've done it once, of course, that's the model, and you can use that in terms of your in terms of your of your reporting going forward. Um, if we'd have had, been having this conversation 10 years ago, 20 years ago, it would have been a much different story. That the differences would have been very large, but now the differences are quite are quite uh, limited. So it's a it's a process, but nothing that should um, defer or delay or certainly not stop. Uh, the IPO of a, of a, of a uh, Vietnamese company onto a onto a London market. Okay, great, thanks, Robin. Very very encouraging on that point. Um, possible, not as difficult as it, it used to be would be my takeaways from that. Um, ne next question comes from um, Sean, and this one is: Are there any particular issues for Vietnamese companies um, on the governance, risk, or or legal side? Um, and I'd like to pass this one to to Jan, if I may. Yeah, thank you, Ollie. Well, I mean, I've I've gone through a number of the points already in what we discussed earlier, but I think you know what one particular point to bear in mind is that the listing process will be, you know, perhaps less familiar to Vietnamese companies than it may be to other companies elsewhere. That's obviously not an issue that's um, restricted to Vietnam. It, it it also applies to other uh, jurisdictions where listings are less common. But it, it does mean, I think, that there is just generally more time that should be allowed for a sort of education and, and bringing up to speed process. Um, and then I would just also refer back to the points that Matt made about, uh, uh, you know, f potential foreign ownership restrictions that apply in certain sectors, because those would need to be borne in mind as part of any listing process. OK, fantastic. Um, I've got I've got I've got one more here, and this one um, I think this one might be picked up by by Robin, but let me know if not. And it, the, the the question here is around whether a highways concession would be a potential company for listing on on AIM. Thanks, thanks, Ollie. Um, I mean, one thing that I didn't say in the uh, in preparing and and and. Uh, for an IPO, and what what the investors really want to see is is um, in terms of of uh, I guess geographic spread. It, it is quite difficult, or can be quite difficult, to uh, IPO a, a one country company or a company that's purely dependent on one country for its income. Um, I'm obviously not if it's a gold mine. Uh, that's that's uh, that, that works well. Um, but I think it's it's it would be more difficult if this was just a one contract company. There's no reason why you can't float a company. Which 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 uh, receives income from from uh, highway concessions and infrastructure concessions, but I think if it's just one concession, that would be more challenging. But really, as as uh, John said, it's a case by case basis. It's a case of looking at the at, at the quality of that of that contract uh, contract, the security, how long it's in place, how long it will be in place, the track record of the people who are actually running the company, but also importantly, what their plans are going forward. If the plans are to extend their what they're doing into other concessions, and they've got a track record of doing something similar maybe in a previous um, environment, then I mean, all things are possible. If it, if it ticks the box about quality, if it ticks the box about 
governance. If it ticks the box about value, then it's possible. Um, it's, it's not an obvious candidate, but um, certainly be, be happy to, to look through it in more detail to see if there's something there that we could uh, we can make work. Okay, hey, fantastic, Robin. I thought John was putting his hand up for a second, but I think he might have just been adjusting his, his screen. What? Um, no, I was just going to yeah. add to that point. We had a Russian company which which uh, had contracts to clean all the snow in Moscow, right? Um, so they did well, but it was very important to, uh, to basically tell everyone what's going on with the Moscow government. So in that case, they were very much dependent upon the largesse of the Moscow government. So there's always those risks and if you're a one contract same thing if you're if you provide screens to apple and apple's your only customer uh, everyone's going to be looking very carefully at the next renewal uh, date so those are just questions you're going to have to answer there's no reason why you can't take that concession uh, to aim uh, but as robin was saying you just need to be prepared to answer those questions yeah and i, and I was just also going to draw the analogy with um, some of the renewal renewable energy investment companies that you see on AIM. So those often start with um, you know, either a single asset or, or a very small portfolio of assets, um, which you know, yields a certain dividend and income stream, and that's what investors are investing in. But, but at, what Robin has said is entirely true. With those companies, the idea is that they grow their portfolio over time and therefore spread the risk. So uh, I think one has to look at what the growth opportunities are for any sort of yield producing asset company such as a highway concession. Okay, excellent. Um, we actually had a, um, a follow-up question um, from um, Neville Anderson relating to the offshore energy company. And this, this one's quite interesting, I, I, I think, to lead into around the, 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 the timescales for a, an IPO listing. Um, so Neville's asking around the the company that would like to to do a listing. Um, the 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 offshore energy installations are only a six month old startup. Is 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 this something that's suitable for listing, or is there something in the timescales that you would you would like to comment on? Um, who, who'd like to go first? I'm happy to. Uh, okay. I'm happy to make a start. I mean, the uh, the track record requirements differ ac uh, across the various markets on the London Stock Exchange. Uh, so in theory, it's certainly possible to list early stage companies, particularly on AIM, for instance. Um, and what has to be shown, though, is that that company is one that is generally thought to be fit for listing. So, um, you know, the the short answer to the question is, it may well be possible, but um, the various advisors involved have to think that actually the, the story as a whole stacks up for a, a listing at such an early stage. Okay, excellent. Would, would, any, would anyone else like to um, join in and answer that? I think it could be answered in various different uh, lenses. I mean, I, th I think that's right. It really depends upon the, the nature of the business. I mean, in, in that particular example for, for new energy, uh, where there's there's that sort of rollout risk, people are going to be looking for, you know, some track record, you know, to see, okay, you delivered on that. Um, doesn't have to be three years, but you know, there needs to be some point of comparison to, to show that you're delivering. Now, if you're in another field, that may not be uh, as, as big of an issue. You know, if you if you have, uh, a, a new drug line uh, that's going to, you know, I mentioned the case like of Renalytics um, or uh, your gold mine, <laughs> you know, it's uh, it's going to be a different it's going to be a different case. But in that particular instance, they probably will be looking for proof that you can deliver on on the plan. And it'll probably also more. require a closer analysis of the the actual underlying contracts. Uh, for an early stage company, because the, the company will be very dependent on those. I think, Ollie, I'll just add, uh, and that's, this is this is this is the great thing about 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 AIM really, in particular. I just sort of um, differentiate between what's 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 possible, but what what works. So the great thing about AIM is a very flexible market, uh, and in theory, the six of us could actually form a company tomorrow and be on the market in probably um, two months' time. In theory, the question is. 
who would want to buy the shares, especially from us. Um, so it's, a, a, Amy's, Amy's, in terms of its in fact works, is very, very flexible. You can do, you can come to market very quickly, but, you, but you've got to be able to raise money. Uh, and so that's the. It's, 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 sometimes Amy, it's the commercial constraints rather than the technical constraints that take the time to uh, think through in terms of is this is this, is this going to work. Okay, fantastic. You know, thanks, thanks all for your responses there, and thanks to the attendees for for putting in those questions. I think we've been able to cover a wide range of things here. I'd just like at this point to give a, a brief opportunity for the panelists to give a final thought on um, what final thoughts really on um, adding increased access to international capital markets for Vietnamese companies and the benefits this could bring. Well, what final thoughts would you, would you give to our attendees on this? John, would you like to go first? Yeah, no, uh, definitely I think the uh, everything is is trending Vietnam <laughs> with the new rules. Again, this is a, yeah, this is uh, an, an, a second, our second event uh, on Vietnam this year. Tremendous amount of uh, demand uh, from from the investor community. I, I participated in an investor luncheon uh, a couple of weeks ago where Vietnam was was on the menu. Uh, people were saying they're looking for that uh, for growth. Uh, and the important thing is having the supply. So I think it's 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 great that we've talked about a number of different ways to market today. Great. Thanks. Um, I can see to um, give a, a final thought before we perhaps hand back to, to, to Gavin for the wrap-up. I think I'd just say, Ollie, that uh, we first did our, our, well, well the, we did our first IPO involving a Vietnamese company back in 2006, a company called Asiana Properties. That company's still in the UK market. And I think since then it's become easier for all the points that we raised earlier in terms of the economy, in terms of the growth. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's a market with huge potential. Uh, and um, yeah, we'd like to be working with, with uh, Vietnamese companies coming to London over the next two or three years and, and, yeah. and, uh, and longer. I just like to mention, I didn't um, give you the opportunity to answer the question. Please go ahead. <laughs> I, I, I just echo what the other panelists said. I mean, sitting here in Vietnam, we're just seeing such a huge uplift in, in interest in all sectors from overseas investors. We're seeing international energy companies coming here to build projects. We're seeing manufacturers coming here to build plants. And um, we're, we're also seeing international lenders coming here and get a, being willing to take on Vietnamese risk. And it's, it's just something was almost unheard of even five years ago. And so hopefully, hopefully we're also going to kind of see the flip side of that and see Vietnamese companies able to benefit as well and gaining the gaining yeah. access to overseas capital to for their for their for their expansion plan. So yeah, I think it's a really positive message at the moment. Okay, fantastic. I think in the interest of time, it's probably time to hand back to to, to Gavin Wilkins. Yeah, th thanks very much, Ollie. Um, it's going to have to be a brief roundup, I think. I think we've used up our, our allotted time. Um, but I, I hope everyone's enjoyed today's webinar. And if you haven't, I hope that you've at least found it informative. Um, I, th I think I'd, I speak for all of the speakers today. Um, um, I think when when I say we all welcome stronger and, and deeper trading links between Vietnam and, and the UK, uh, and we're very optimistic about a bright future for those trading links. I think if you want to discuss any of the content of today's webinar, please do get in touch. I think there's a, a short survey or follow-up note going to be circulated to the participants that will enable you to get in touch with any of today's speakers. Um, I'd like to extend a, a very big thank you to today's excellent lineup of speakers. Thanks for uh, for making time today. It's been fantastic and and i'd like to offer an even bigger thank you to uh, to everyone who's joined us today and and listen to what we have to say thank you very much indeed um and goodbye thank you